Hi, thanks for coming out. Uh, Kathleen Grissom was born and raised in Saskatchewan and is happily, uh, happily rooted in Southside, Virginia, where she and her husband live in a plantation tavern that they renovated. In addition to the kitchen house, she is also the author of Glory Over Everything. Kathleen Grissom. Well, thank you. I, do we really need this? Do we need this to you? Can you hear me back there? Yes. Fine? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then I'll just turn it over this way. Unless you can't hear me, then please say so in the back. Just wave at me and I'll speak up. <laughs> yeah. Camera. Camera? I gave it to you. Oh, no, maybe I didn't. You did. <laughs> Excuse me. This is my husband. Hi. Who asked for my camera, but I gave it to him already. <laughs> so... I think I'll just, I'll step right out here if that's okay. So I am a, a white girl from Saskatchewan who came down to Virginia and is writing a book about slavery. And how that happened is what I'll tell you right now. Did most of you read The Kitchen House? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, if it's all right, I'll talk to you about The Kitchen House first, and then I'll tell you how glory over everything came to be. Um, my husband and I moved down to Virginia uh, to renovate an old place that had once been a stagecoach stop, uh, a, a stagecoach stop and a tavern. And we discovered that it also was a working plantation. It had been a working plantation mm -hmm. originally. So while we were renovating this old place, um, we were shown an old map. And on that old map, we saw our place. Our place was called Harvey's Tavern. And, but maybe about a half mile away, there was another notation on that map, and it said Negro Hill. And I don't know what there was about that notation, but something about it, I became almost obsessed with it. I just had to know what happened there. So I asked uh, four different local historians, and there was four different answers, <laughs> but no collective story. So finally, after uh, five tries, I managed to get an appointment with an old African-American woman. Uh, she has since passed away, and she was very old at the time. Uh, but she didn't know what I was about, and I was trying to call her all the time. And she, uh, she you know, made excuses and finally mm -hmm. met with me. And then when we sat uh, to speak, uh, I told her what I was looking for. I said, if anyone would know the story, you must know the story, because she was also a local historian. So she said, well, yes, I think it's what she thought ha something happened in the town square. She thought a young black woman uh, was hung in the town square for prostitution. But I said to her, Mrs. Lowe, don't you think it would have happened on that hill for that hill to be named that way? And she looked at me for a while, and she said, um, why don't you write your own story? And I said, well, I don't have a story to tell. So she said, um, why don't you pray on it? And I thought, come on. I thought, uh, I can pray all I want, but I don't have a story here. I knew that. <laughs> but I didn't say that to her. And I, uh, hi. hi, I'm just hi. explaining about how I started, how I wrote The Kitchen House. So uh, have you read that or are you familiar with it? Oh, okay. So um, I guess I must have started I, I met this woman who told me to pray about writing this story that I didn't have. Mm. And, but I respected her so much, and I must have started to incorporate, I meditate every morning, and I must have started to incorporate those thoughts in my morning meditation. At least that explains to me why one morning, a couple of weeks later, I had been meditating down at the bottom of our stream. We had 25 acres, and at the bottom of the stream, uh, I mean, at the bottom of a hill, there was a stream, and I'd always go down there. It was so beautiful, and I would meditate down there. So this morning, about two weeks later, I was coming back up that hill, our hill, and looking out toward where Negro Hill would have been. And I just said out loud, what happened there? And then I came back into the house, and I sat down to do my daily journaling, which I had done for a long time. But that morning, something happened that had never happened to me before. It was as though a movie started to play. 
and I was, or, or if I ask any of you to describe you, your last Thanksgiving and you start to tell me in detail, you can bring me into it. And if you get really detailed about the food and about every, every what people were wearing and what your uncle looked like and what he said and how you all laughed, you can pull me right in. That's the way this was. I was in it. And, but I was also feeling the emotions. And I saw this little girl running up the hill trying to hold her mother back. The mother was in a panic, and she was just terrified. I could feel what the mother was feeling. I could feel what the little girl was feeling. And the three of us together ran up this hill, and at the top of the hill, we saw a black woman hanging from a tree. And I just couldn't believe it. I reread what I had written because I had written all of this down. And I reread it because it stopped there. It just, boom, stopped there. I reread what I had written and I, I didn't know where it had come from. I had never had an experience like that before and I thought, I don't need to know what happened here. This is, this is more than I bargained for. And it was just so dark and so such a, an out-of-body experience that I thought, I, I don't need this. So I put it away in my desk drawer and I thought, that's the end of that. And then I was talking to my dad about two months later, maybe. Dad still lives in Saskatchewan, Canada, which is where I'm from originally. And Dad is still going, he's still doing well. He's 96 years old, but this was about uh, 15 years ago. I think that's the right math, I'm not sure. 15, 20 years ago, somewhere in there. Dad said to me, he had a friend, who, a golfing buddy, who was researching his genealogy. And this man was able to trace his family back to Ireland when they came on board ship over to Norfolk, Virginia in 1790. And dad said, but on board the ship, the parents died and they left three little orphans. And then he said, they could find the two little boys, but they couldn't find a trace of the little girl. And as soon as dad said that, I had this chill go through my body. And I thought, are you getting chills? I still do too. She still does that to me. And she'll do it to people sometimes in the audience as well. It's like that, that feeling, she's here. You know, that's the feeling I get, right? I just knew that she belonged to that story somehow. I don't know how and I don't know why, but that's just the way it happened for me. So I had a date now. I had 1790, and I knew it had happened somewhere in Southside Virginia. So I began to research everything. Southside Virginia, 1790. So I began at the little uh, libraries. I love libraries. I always have, always will, I'm sure. But I began at our little local library in Charlotte Courthouse. And there I was able to access some uh, genealogy, some histories of uh, families that lived in the area and read them uh, through the library. Um, I went over to the courthouse. But also at that little library, I found two books. One was called Bullwhip Days, and the other was called Weevils in Wheat. And those two books, I later learned, were part of a huge study. In 1936, the government sent workers out to interview people who had once been slaves. And I was reading slave narratives. And it was when I was reading those slave narratives, I am not good with languages. I do not pick up other languages easily. And people have said, how did you get the dialect? While I was reading those narratives, I felt the support. That's all I can say. I felt the support as though there was this support behind it. And I just knew somehow that those voices would come when I needed them. I, d I don't know that I was really that aware at that time, but I just knew that there was that support there. So that was one of the places. I went up to Colonial Williamsburg uh, to the Historical Society in Richmond. There were, we had some renovated plantations around us, but the one that I in particular kept going back to was called Presswood Plantation. And that one, eventually I discovered tall oaks is sort of structured like it on the interior. But I didn't know I was, I didn't know that I was doing that or that I was studying it for that reason. Um, so I had all, all of this research. I had this handwriting and all down. This was way before the computer was going on. I was handwriting it all down. And I had no story. I was still meditating about it, but there was no story. Nothing was coming. Um, 
That year, I went up to rehab down in, in Virginia. We have something called Charlottesville Festival of the Book. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Since mm -hmm. it went, yeah, it's a <coughs> wonderful event every year where they have writers come from all over the country and they read um, from their latest books. So it's just a really great event. But that year, Robert Morgan was coming uh, to read from his book, Gap Creek. Mm -hmm. And I had read Gap Creek and really liked it. So I couldn't wait to go and sit in the audience. But I had read it about two years before. So when I sat in the audience, I had sort of forgotten how it was written. As soon as I was sitting there and he began to read, he started to read in the voice of a 16-year-old girl. And I immediately knew that that was supposed to happen. That little, my little girl was going to tell the story. So I came home and I sat down and I pretty much said, where are you? With that, I saw her coming up the drive in the back of the wagon, and I picked up my pencil, and I followed behind her. And that's how I wrote the story. It would come in increments. It would come until I was tired for the day. And at the time, we had renovated this, this tavern. So we had a tea room, and we had an herb farm, and we were raising cashmere goats. I know. We were doing a lot of that, that sort of thing. So I was writing whenever I had the opportunity. I would write, when I, if, I, if I had left off the day before, and I, had, I never had any idea of what was coming the next day. I had no idea in the story what was going to happen until you, the reader, knew what was going to happen. So I was in the blind through the whole thing, and it took me five years to write it. Now, the first draft probably took me the first two years, I would say. So it, but then I did a lot of renovation, I mean, not a lot of renovation, a lot of rewriting. So. As I was rewrite, or as I was um, uh, writing the first draft, I really, every time I'd stop, it, every time it would stop and I would stop writing, I would think, well, that's it, because there was nothing more. And it wasn't as though I had a planned idea, or whenever I would try to think, well, what are they going to do now, or what's going to happen now, I was always wrong. So I would have to wait until I had an opportunity to write again, and then I would go sit down and write or read what I had written the day before. And it was as though that was flicking a switch, and the movie would start to play, and I'd be given another increment. The only time the story would stop is if I hadn't done my research. The best example that I have about that is um, when Miss Martha has the opportunity to go to Philadelphia to see her parents, or her father, I think, is alive. I'm, I was so excited for her. I was so happy. This, finally, this woman is going to get a break. She's mm -hmm. going to have the opportunity to have some fun, have a good time, and maybe come back more clear-headed and maybe even off laudanum. I just, I was really hopeful for her. They left. They drove away in the carriage, and I stayed back on the plantation. I was with everyone there. I saw what was going on, and they were very open with me and welcoming, and I, I was there. But we weren't hearing, hearing anything back from and I couldn't understand why. I knew they were waiting. I knew everyone there was waiting. Nothing was coming back. And then I thought, well, I wonder what's going on in Philadelphia. So I decided to go to the library and find some books on Philadelphia, 1791, and discovered that was the year of the plague. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Ms. Martha and her family, Dory, two kids, mm -hmm. Dory, and her baby Campbell, and they, had, they were riding into the plague. And as soon as I knew that, as soon as I knew about, I had to study, I had to study about the plague and what happened in Philadelphia and just how devastating it was at that time. But as soon as I knew all of the details, I started getting letters back and I started to find out what was happening. So that's how the story could stop, is if I didn't know. So I've come to see now that my research is really setting the stage and I need to know on that stage where everything is, what everything is meant for, so that when my character comes and picks something up over here, I know exactly what it is. I know exactly what he or she is going to use it for, and I need to know if it's food, what it tastes like, how they're going to cook it. I need to know all of the details. I needed to be immersed in that time. So that's setting the stage, and then they come in fully formed. When Lavinia came up the drive and the captain picked her up, mm -hmm. took her out of the wagon, 
and set her down and then gave her over to Uncle Jacob, I knew all of the characters. I, it was as though it was long lost family. And the characters that came into it, when Uncle Jacob picked her up, I could feel him, I knew him, I knew he was kind. I could, I could sense him. And it was the same when he brought her into the kitchen house. I knew Belle, as soon as I saw her, I knew Belle. And it was, it was as though I was welcomed into this family. So that was the way I wrote the kitchen house. <laughs> yes. So then, I thought my next book was going to be about Crow Mary. Crow Mary was a woman that I was introduced to with my parents um, when I went up to a, for a visit in Saskatchewan, Canada. There's a place called Fort Walsh, and uh, there's a, it's a historical site, and it's there for a reason. It marks a place where 40 Assiniboine natives were uh, slaughtered, <coughs> and um, while we were there, there was a woman, a docent, dressed as Crow Mary. And she said, I am here because I was married to Abe Farwell, one of the fur traders, back in 1872. And then she began to tell of her life. And as she was speaking, I just sort of lost everything she was saying and just went into this place where I knew that she was my next story. I knew she was my next person that I would be coming to. So when I finished the kitchen house, uh, no, I didn't finish the kitchen house. I had one last copy editing to do, but before I did that, I was waiting for the copy editor to finish her job. So we went out to Montana to the Crow Reservation, and there I began to study her life and her culture. And I could feel her, and I knew she'd come, and it was just really exciting for me, and I almost hated to come back to finish up the kitchen house. I did come back. <coughs> And then we turned around and, well, a couple of months later, we then went back out to Montana to the Crow Reservation. But this time I couldn't feel her. I couldn't, I, w I was blocked. And it was as though a veil had come down and standing in front of that veil was Jamie from the kitchen house saying, I'm next. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. So I knew I wasn't feeling Crow Mary. So <laughs> I came back and I called my agent and I said, Rebecca, I know you want me to be writing about Crow Mary because she really did. And um, I said, but you know, Jamie uh, from the kitchen house is here and he's expecting me to write his story next. And she laughed uncomfortably. <laughs> and, but uh, she said, Kathy, that's probably your muse and you have to listen to your muse. So with that, I began to research. I knew it was 1830, I don't know how. I knew it was Jamie, I don't know how. But I knew, I always, people would say after I wrote The Kitchen House, what happened to so-and-so? I didn't know what happened to any of them, any more than you did. When the story ended for you, it's, it ended for me. But I could always see Jamie. And he was a grown man, and I knew he was a wealthy aristocrat. And sure enough, when I, when I found him, he was a wealthy aristocrat living in Philadelphia society. But if you remember, he's passing his wife. Mm -hmm. Well, you probably didn't know he was passing his wife. Well, just you couldn't remember that. <laughs> but you could remember that he was a, a little guy. He was 13 when he left college. Right. Right? So he is now passing his wife in Philadelphia. So that's Jamie. But when I met Jamie, even though he wanted me to tell his story, he was very reserved with me. It was almost as though he didn't know that I knew his secret. And so he was being very guarded with me and very um, unemotional and very um, re more reserved. I think I've already said that. So um, I wrote the first draft only in his voice. So I got the story down only in his voice. And I gave it to my agent. And she said, well, Kathy, he's not a very likable guy. And I said, he really is. I said, he's, this is about his redemption. He really is a nice guy. She said, well, I think you're going to have to get that across because readers don't like to read about someone that they're not crazy about mm -hmm. or that, they're not, that they don't really like, I should say. Crazy. Mm -hmm. So I went back, sat down with my characters, and fortunately, this little guy, Pan, was in there, but he was, his, his voice comes in. 
and he's this little black boy who's about six years old when we meet him. And he's just absolutely precious. Um, he also has great insight and he lets us know just a little bit more about Jamie. And then there's a third voice in part one of Glory Over Everything. And that third voice is Caroline, Jamie's mother and mistress. So those three speak for the first in the first half of the book. The second half of the book is Jamie's voice still. Little Pan speaks right throughout. But the third voice is Suki. Do you remember Suki from the Kitchen Books? Mm -hmm. Suki's voice comes in again. So when Jamie has to go down south on business, he is confronted with his past. Because there is Suki still enslaved on a plantation. Why the great business swamp comes into play, none of us know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's definitely part of the book. If you like, I'll read a little bit of Pan's voice. Is that OK? <laughs> I know, don't you love her? Mm -hmm. Wait yeah. until you read about her. You're going to <laughs> fall in love. <laughs> she broke my heart, is what she did. Well, I'll, I'll read about Suki because this is where, uh, if you'll re recall, um, her, she was taken at the age of 13 when Marshall grabbed her away from Lavinia, took her away from Lavinia as punishment. So this is Suki. Also, when Suki goes down, she's taken down to the quarters at that point. And uh, we meet, oh, in this book we also meet Rankin again. <coughs> Rankin's still around. But uh, as well, not just Rankin, but Rankin has a son by the name of Jake. We didn't meet him in the kitchen house. We only know that he had children with Ida. Do you recall that? Ida was one of the slaves down in the quarters. <coughs> so we hear about Ida and we hear about Rankin and Jake in this section. Ida also, if you remember, uh, is Suki's grandmother. Jim, uh, Jimmy was her father, Dory was her mother, and Jimmy was Ida's son. <coughs> but Suki never grew up knowing Ida because she was up and she was more privileged in the big house. Three days after they take me away from Miss Lavinia, the slave traders come. Ida and me jump awake when Rankin and Jake bust open the door in the middle of the night. When Rankin starts tying up my wrists, I yell to Ida, go get Miss Lavinia, but Ida just stands there quiet. Shut up, Rankin talks to me in a way that makes my mouth go dry. He grunts at me, niggers, acting like white folk. There's one more up in that big house that needs selling, he says to Jake. That's Jamie, the next one to go. You mean the one with the bad eye, Jake asks? Yeah, he's the one. He's white as me, Jake says. Rankin snorts. He's white, at you, white as you, but that don't mean you both not niggers. The dark look that goes over Jake's face scares me so much that I start to call out again for Miss Lavinia. That's when Jake takes a rag that was tied around his neck and comes at me. Don't let them take me, I say to Ida, before Jake ties the rag tight around my mouth. Ida is pulling on her dress, but she stays quiet. She follows us outside and watches as they tie me to the three other men who all look done in. They sit as soon as I'm tied, and the rope pulls me down to the ground with them. I start to cry, but with the rag in my mouth, I choke. My tongue burns when I work to loosen the rag, and I keep looking for Ida to help, but her head is down and turned away. When the traders go off for a drink with Rankin and Jake, Ida comes over. Remember who you is, she says in my ear when she loosens up the rag. You no slave like me. You raise like a white girl. You knows how to read and write. You members that. Hold your head up like a white girl. That way they buy you for the big house someplace. By now I'm too scared to cry. I keep looking up toward the where the big house is and wonder why nobody's coming to get me. Where is everybody? Where are they taking me? Nobody's telling me nothing. When the traders come back, one of them slaps at the air with his whip 
and the man I is tied to jumps up like a gun goes off. Before I know what's going on, they start out walking, and I get jerked along so fast that I can hardly keep up. When the traitor whacks his whip again, it cracks down beside me. I'm so scared that my water starts running down my legs. Keep a good eye on her, Rankin calls out to Jake, and that's how I find out that Jake is coming along with the slave traders. In the next days, we stop at other farms. They got slaves to sell, so others that get tied up with us, but I'm the only girl. It's cold, and I'm scared to cry, and all the men stay quiet as me. They keep their heads down and move ahead, and I wonder why they don't have no fight. Then I hear two of them talking at night and find out that the one man was already killed for getting loose and trying to run. In those next days, Jake don't leave me alone. After he takes the rag from my mouth, he keeps talking smart until I finally sass back. He laughs. Oh, listen to that one from the big house. Don't she think she's somebody? I guess we'll get to find out what she looks like when they take those fine clothes off and set her up on the block for everybody to see. That scares me enough to start me crying, and after that, Every chance he gets, Jake rides up beside me and tells me what's going to happen to me up on that block. I keep telling myself, don't pay him no mind. Miss Lavinia won't let that happen. I know she's sending Papa George for me any time now. In the end, it's good that Jake is there. At night, the traders talk rough about me being a woman and what they want to do with me. But Jake tells them that his daddy sent me along, sent him along to make sure I get to the auction without no man on me. She'll bring more money never been used yet, he tells them. They keep me tied at the end of the line. One of the men has a bad foot, but that don't stop them from making us move fast. I keep up good enough, but after three days of walking, my feet are so puffed up that when I take off my shoes, I can't put them back on. The man tied next to me watches me when I set them to the side. Before we get up again, he clicks his tongue and nods at my shoes and then at my feet, letting me know that I got to put them on. I can't, I whisper, my feet is too sore. But he nods again, and when I shake my head, he pushes his legs out for me to see both his feet swell up and bleeding. I see what he's telling me, and I put my shoes back on, and after that, I don't take my shoes off no more, no matter how sore they get. Sometimes we stop for food and water, but tired as we are, he's always ready to get going again. None of us has warm clothes to keep out the cold, and when you move, you work up the heat. At night, they give us some blankets. After about three days, my bowels start moving on their own. Up to then, I don't let myself go like the men do when the drivers tell us to squat. We's all tied together, and I turn my head when the men do their business, but I hold on. Then a couple of days in, my stomach starts hurting, and before I know it, I don't have no say. The worst part is it gets all over my skirts, and then the smell starts coming off me. As soon as Jake picks up on my troubles, he starts in on me but I don't let him see me cry no more. So, Miss Suki, they don't teach you how to use a privy up at the big house, he say? Cold as I is, my face gets hot. He makes pig sounds. You sure do stink like the pigs down at the barn. You dress like a lady, but you just a pig. My bowels keep running, and after two days, my legs and my private parts is so sore, I don't care no more. All I want is to get someplace to wash up. On our last night out, I'm shaking from the cold, and I feel so sore all over that when everybody is sleeping, I can't hold myself back no more, and I start to cry. The man who's tied next to me is the same man who tells me early on to keep my shoes on my feet. Now he slides closer and talks to me. What's your mama's name? Sorry, this is still really emotional for me. What's your mama's name? I'm so surprised to hear him say something that I stopped crying. Dory, I whisper, but she's dead. Then who raise you up, he asks. Belle and Miss Lavinia, I say, but that starts me crying again. They do a mighty fine job of raising me, he says. I'm so cold, my teeth is chattering. Old Ernest here, he's coming close to you. He don't mean you no harm, he's just going to keep you warm, he says. But I stink, I say. You stink, but it ain't nothing that won't come off with a good dose of water, he says, as he moves closer beside me. He stays there all night but I can't sleep because his being nice to me makes me cry even more. That's sweet. So, as you can see, I'm still very involved and I'm just releasing the characters. What happened for me after the kitchen house, I didn't realize that when I was doing the final copy editing and I was crying and crying and crying, that I was saying goodbye to them. I was releasing them. They no longer were mine. 
and that's what happens for me. It's sort of a gradual letting go. I think I can safely say that I can read from the kitchen house now, and I, I'm more detached, mm -hmm. but I'm still very attached here. Mm -hmm. So that's how that works mm -hmm. for me as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have any questions for me. Yes. Is there going to be a continuation? Of glory over everything? Uh, did you hear that? Is there going to be a continuation of glory over everything? <laughs> <laughs> My intention is to write about Crow Mary. Yeah. <laughs> let her go. <laughs> so uh, we'll see, because I see this as a spiritual gift. Um, I don't. This is my own personal interpretation. I feel that there was a group of souls who wanted their stories told, and for some reason, I'm the lucky recipient. And it's the same thing for me with Glory Over Everything. But you want, as a reader, Absolutely. I want to know what, where, what, what happened, happened at, after. Yes. After I'm not going to say what happens, but at the end. I, fin I read the book, Glory but I want to find out what, okay. what happened to all the others. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's what I thought would be in this. I mean, you could keep going I mean, and going, you know. <laughs> That's <laughs> my point. Yeah. That's what I keep thinking. This could go on until the day I die. Okay. And uh, so, and it makes me laugh because I was sitting in New York with the, the, the whole boardroom was filled with all of my team. <laughs> they call them themselves my team, right? So it's all the different people that are, you know, it, it takes a town to do a book, right? Not a village. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they were talking about my next books and I'm going to be 69 years old in June. Charles can you remind me. <laughs> so I was sitting there and I was thinking, do they know how old I am? They had to know how old I was, but how many books do they think I have in me here? So, and, and it isn't that I lack, um, there are other ideas that I've had, very strong ideas, but um, not connected to these guys. In glory, there are some children at the end that you'll find out that are just adorable, right? And it's really quite uh, complex. Their lives are all very complex, right? They're going back into a complex situation. I think that's a good way to word it. Um, and I wanted to know too what was going to happen. Yeah. But it ended. Yeah. yeah. Just a, like the kids. As a reader, story. you wanted to keep on going yeah. because mm -hmm. it reached yeah. a good ending. It mm -hmm. did. And then. Now what? Now, now what? Because yeah. I mean, because yeah. you did it with the you know from the kitchen house I know. to this. So yep. thank you, but I, I want more. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm. I hope that I can write about Crow Mary first, mm -hmm. because she's just a soul whose story needs to be told, mm -hmm. and particularly um, as a native, as a Crow native, um, there are so many stories, and her life in particular was one where she was married to this white fur trader, and that was unusual for the time, because generally the white fur trader would cohabitate with the natives, and then they would leave. But this man stayed, and they had went through tremendous experiences together, but one of the, the s most startling things when I was researching her life was that she had three children, and those three children were stolen from her and taken to the Carlisle School oh. in Carlisle. And I've, I've been doing enough research that I've been able to trace those children. So, but can you imagine the devastation for that mother out in Montana and those children are gone? Yeah. Do you know what happened to the three children? I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there was just a big article in the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer about the Carlisle School and how they're big, the, they want to move some of the kids that died there back to their To homes. the reservations, is that right? Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, well, that would be, well, I think, exactly what mm -hmm. should happen, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I went to Carlisle to do research there, and I was expecting that, are any of you affiliated with the school? <laughs> Just a, but, but the truth is, I can tell the truth. I was expecting that there'd be some resistance to the truth of the story. And instead, I don't recall what her, what, do you remember, Charles, what her title was? She was head of the whole deal, as far as I can remember. Mm -hmm. And she came to me and she sat with me when she knew the story I was after. 
And she said, Kathy, what you need to do is tell the truth. Tell the real story. Tell the tragedy, the, the tragedy behind it. So that's part of the reason that I feel so drawn to Pearl So I'm hoping that I have the opportunity to tell that story. But um, whether it's going to be this time or not, we'll see. But thanks for that question. Thank you. Does any what did you do before you started writing? Were you always a writer of sorts? Or I was asked if I was always a writer of sorts. I was a writer of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a lot of bad poetry. Oh. And then, but I can tell you how I came to write. Um, I had always written short stories and a lot of bad poetry, like I said. But when I had that tea room running, mm -hmm. I, w I had been keeping this journal for about a year, two years maybe. And I was sending some of these, they were like short stories in this, in this journal. Uh, I was sending them back to friends who lived in Manhattan, and they were getting the biggest kick out of the idea that I was living on a farm, uh, you know, sort of with all these animals and tea room and all that sort of thing. So they said to me, you should try to get this published. So I started to feel pretty good about myself, thinking, hey, you know, you can write. <laughs> well, uh, then I had the tea room. And I had been told about um, this woman, Eleanor Drury Dolan, who was a neighbor of mine in the country. She lived about maybe a half mile, a mile away. Uh, but I was intimidated to meet her. She was a southern gentlewoman. She was well thought of in the community. And she was a published poet. And to me, that was about as good as you could get, right? So they brought her for her birthday to my tea room. And my neighbor woman knew that I was writing this journal. I was more friendly with my neighbor woman, or this neighbor who lived next door. Um, so she introduced me to Eleanor, and Eleanor uh, said to me, Kathy, uh, I've been told that you're a writer, that you write. And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> so she said to me, well, could I see some of your work? So I brought down this journal that I was in, those pages of this thing, and I gave it to this poor woman, uh, and then waited for her to call. And she did call, maybe about four or five days later, and she said, Kathleen, and she has this wonderfully southern voice and she's just so she's so beautiful she's so uh, always meticulously dressed and beautifully put together and she t intimidates the heck out of you but she's the sweetest woman in the world I didn't know that at the time she said Kathleen so I've read your work and I said oh and she said um, yes would you like some help <laughs> uh huh. and luckily I got off my high horse long enough to say yes, please. And then this kind, wonderful woman took me under her wing for the next two and a half years and had me come to her home two, sometimes three times a week. And we would sit in her study and we would go over that, we went over that journal for those two and a half years. Because she was a poet, she taught me that every word counts. And it was after we finished that I saw the map so that's how that worked. Yeah. I didn't just do this on my own, for sure. Yes? When you were finished with Picture House, did you have any feelings as to how it would be received by the public? Were you feeling pretty good about it, or just wondering how, how is this going to go? Yeah. I was asked, did you hear that? Mm -hmm. I was asked um, um, about the public if I was concerned about how it would be received, the Kitchen House. Um, there was a part of me, I suppose, that was somewhat concerned, but honestly, it took me five years to get an agent. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy to get an agent, and then she got me published, mm -hmm. that um, I, I knew that this was a spiritual gift. And I also knew, and I don't know why, but I knew I was supposed to get it published. So I just worked so hard to, do, to write it as best I could, and then to get it published that I don't think I worried too much about the reception mm -hmm. after that because I knew it was in, a, this is the way I see it, it was in God's hands. Mm -hmm. I did my job and I, both times, I, I wrote it the best, I did the best I could and then I worked at it for five years to get an agent, got an agent, and then after that I didn't think it was my business anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and also I didn't make this story up. The story is one that clearly wanted to be told and my business was not the outcome. It just, I don't see that as my business. 
I can tell you that the reception that I've had from white people and from black people has been the same. Mm -hmm. I have been warm, warmly welcomed with this story. As a matter of fact, above and beyond any of my wildest dreams. So it's been a blessing all around. Charles, are we missing anything? He sat through so many of these talks. <laughs> you, you could stand up here and I could just nod and tell him, yeah, you're right. Is there anything uh, that we're missing that's pertinent? No questions? OK, that's good. But yes. Did you visit Colonial Williamsburg often? I did. Nearby, or you did when you were researching? When I was researching, I did a lot of visits to Colonial Williamsburg. Yeah. And I think I kind of drove those docents a little bit crazy because, you know, you see them cooking and you mm -hmm. smell it and you want to taste it. And, and then I just had loads of, of details that I wanted to know. And a lot, and I wasn't trying to be one of those, you know, uh, people who was being smart. I just wanted to know the details. And sometimes they didn't know the details and they'd have to find out. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'd say I, I don't know that they were so wild about seeing me after a while. <laughs> but I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about. But how far, because uh, I know they travel back and forth, how far was Tall Oaks from Williamsburg? I don't really know. I can say that it probably was a similar distance to where our place was, uh -huh. and that was by car, that's about two hours away, two and a half hours. Three so hours. it would have been a trip. Mm -hmm. yeah. Three hours. Away. Three hours driving time. Yeah. Maybe six days. Yeah, yeah. it was a long, it was a long, long time. It would have been a trip. Mm -hmm. Nothing was easy. And the other thing that surprised me so much when I was doing the research, I always, in my, in the, you know, the romantic mind, you think of this plantation and being so serene, and I never imagined how far out they were and how isolated they were. So it, it wasn't just a matter of, you know, taking a, a three-hour drive and uh, going into the city. They were isolated, and those, th they were isolated. I think that was because of the, the story about the one fellow who did the writing about the... Uh, oh, about the captain? Yeah, I, I think that was really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, when I was writing the story, I found out that if I tried to change the story, the characters would sort of get up and leave. And so I found out early on that if I tried to change anything about what was happening, they would just dissipate. So I learned that with the captain. I always wanted the captain to tell Miss Martha who Belle was. I thought if he would just do that, it would make things so much mm -hmm. easier on everyone. Mm -hmm. And when I tried to change that writing of that, that's what I did. I tried to change the writing and he left. Everyone left. Mm -hmm. They just disappeared. So I then went back and rewrote it exactly the way they were showing it, and they all came on, and then the story evolved. But that bothered me, even after it was published. And I just thought, how could this man not have told his wife who Belle really was? Mm -hmm. And then after the book was published, there was a man down in South Carolina who wrote a book review about the kitchen house in a newspaper. And I think that I have it here. Very short. It's a couple of. I hope I have it here. I try to carry it with me because that's often what people ask me is why didn't the captain tell his wife? So, this is what he wrote Mary Chestnut, the wife of a South Carolina planter and mid, mid level Confederate bureaucrat, wrote the most famous diary kept in Richmond during the Civil War. In fact, the South never had a more ardent patriot. Yet Mary Chestnut's reaction to Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin was peculiar because it was so telling. She wrote, Mrs. Stowe did not hit the sorest spot because she made Simon Legree a bachelor. An earlier generation would have immediately recognized Simon Legree as the black-hearted overseer of Uncle Tom's Cabin. White women of Chestnut's time and class often lived close to light-skinned slaves 
who bore a remarkable resemblance to their husbands or fathers. Yet this subject was never discussed because it was taboo. So I was coming at it from today's world and my thinking. But that just didn't happen back then. It was a different mind. It was a different mindset back then. So, so that's that. Well, do any of you want me to sign your books for you? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for coming this evening. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not sure where I'm going to